Hello everyone and welcome back to the channel whether you are watching on YouTube or listening on a streaming service this is Vocal Arts with Peter Barber. Just recently I had the great pleasure of chatting with Lane Stein of Voiceplay. Some of you have most definitely seen my interview with Jeff which I'll link here if you haven't but I wanted to get a look more behind the scenes as we all know or maybe some of you know some of you don't. Lane is a big part of the brains behind the operation of voice play. He arranges a lot of the music. He's obviously the vocal percussionist and occasionally hops into baritone or covering a bass line. Kind of a jack of all trades there, but the man is brilliant. He also does a lot of the uh, audio engineering for the group, helps out with all the video production of the group, which uh, is also uh, part of what he does. Uh, he has his own video production company and they make amazing things as well. I'm not gonna spoil it all, but it was a really great conversation. We were originally going to pull up a Pro Tools session of Voice Plays music, but unfortunately we couldn't coordinate the audio through Zoom, all these complicated tech things. But we are gonna make sure we do that the next time I have him on, because I know it'll be really cool to see that. But we still had an awesome conversation. It was really wonderful to chat with him. He's a great guy, brilliant guy, and super humble as well. I know you guys are going to enjoy this, so here is Lane Stein. Hello everyone, wherever you are watching or listening from, I am here with Lane Stein, highly requested by the Patreon family and everyone else to, to come on the show. So I'm going to pass it over to Lane and allow him to introduce himself and uh, give us a little snippet about what he does for a living. Sure. I um I sing in an acapella group called Voice Play. I've been doing it for a very long time, ever since we were in high school, which is kind of crazy to think about. Um, I used to be the baritone of the group. We used to be a boy band-ish, and we have morphed into this uh, a cappella group that you hear and see today on YouTube. We make YouTube videos for people of all ages, and that is really our like bread and butter of what we do. We used to tour a lot, and we don't tour that much anymore, although there's something that we can talk about later. Uh, coming up where we are performing live. Um, but it's kind of crazy to think about that in high school, we just, we wanted so bad to have this career of being in an acapella group and like singing the songs that we wanted to sing. And we kind of have it now, <laughs> or at least a very like small following on YouTube. Yeah, so, a small, small following <laughs> of what, 1.5 million subscribers? That's right. <laughs> that yep. is that is quite i would call that quite significant um, i also um i also which is, this is something that's really cool to me is that i write songs with one of the ex voice play members and we have another youtube channel called patty cake productions and we do lots of video production um just high quality lots of special effects and we write our own music and um we actually have our own video production studio that voice play uses a lot and that other people use a lot. So that's another aspect of me that a lot of people don't quite know. Yeah, I was going to, I had actually just heard about that because one of the patrons has a question about that, that I will ask you at the end, but also just piggybacking off that. I did always wonder about the studio space voice play use. So can you, can you just talk a bit about that, about the space that you guys shoot your music videos in and how that, how that's all set up? Yeah, sure. Um, it actually was born out of necessity because we used to rent this one place in downtown Orlando, which is where we live. Um, it was very central and we would always bring like we we bought our own kind of like lighting system and we would always bring the lights to this place and like set them up. It would take forever to set up. But all we had was a day to set up and shoot the video. So it was like it had to go really fast and we never felt like we had the time to do what we really wanted to do. This place shut down and we were looking, Patty Cake was actually looking for a space to do a music video. And we found this mall called the Oviedo Mall, which is crazy to think that malls are even still a thing anymore. 
barely. But they are. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, this mall has transformed and really changed um, the game for malls, I would say. They have lots of different production studios um, and things that you wouldn't quite expect in a mall, uh, training facilities and all these, I don't know, really, really, um, it's really diverse in there. And it's mostly not stores anymore, which mm. is good. <laughs> um, so anyway, that's where we shoot our music videos and um and the studio is actually really nice. Um, it was an old Hallmark. And Tony and I, which is the ex-member of Voiceplay that I was talking about, have turned it into this four-wall kind of giant space. It's like 40 feet by 40 feet where each wall is something different and can get transformed into something, one of these other sets. And then in addition to that, the, the place is so big that you can build whatever custom set in the middle and shoot. So there's a lot of stuff that overlaps with voice play and patty cake. And you'll probably see a lot of the dark castle set that we use for villains layer for patty cake. It's used a lot for voice play and, and even Jeff's channel too. Um, Amazing. So that's where Jeff also shoots his videos. Yes. That same studio. A, a lot of his videos, not all of them, obviously like, you, you know, you still need diversity and we still have to come like go outside of the, of the um, patty cake productions a lot to, to get other stuff, but we get a lot done in there too. Do you guys also have a ton of costumes? We have costumes and props and tables and endless things <laughs> that we have just collected over the years. So for like one of my favorites that you guys have done relatively recently was Hall of the Mountain King. Thoroughly enjoyed, like just love the arrangement, love the video. I was just so captivated the whole time was that did you have to order stuff for that or was that all from from things you had laying around that okay let's break it up <laughs> <laughs> the backdrop that was kind of like a wood background or woods mm -hmm. background scary woods background that was rented and then the trees were brought in from outside literally <laughs> <laughs> um actual trees actual trees and then the floor we bought like a giant like two bales of pine cones and spread that out and that was the set just crazy and a little bit of fog and then the the giant boiling pot was a patty cake video from a hocus pocus video perfect and the the costumes was that the costumes were all custom and the makeup was all custom. Do you have an artist that does all of that each video or do you hire new people each time or certainly not the the hair and makeup and everything is in-house. I know you guys do pretty much everything in-house, <laughs> but I feel like you must have a stylist. <laughs> we have we have the makeup artist that did that one cuz there are so many prosthetics for that. Yeah. Um Rick who is basically in charge of Halloween horror nights at this point in time. Um, he knows what he's doing. And in advance, I sent him this photo of this these cartoons that I like picked out. And they're like five different color cartoons of these like different looking demons. And I was like, this is what I want us to look like. Go. <laughs> awesome. But yeah, awesome. it was a it was a huge fever dream, that one. And the, I definitely got a little bit, you know, from the guys in the group, like, what are we doing? what is this? What are we doing? Why are we doing this? And I was like, trust me, it's going to be good. <laughs> yeah. Well, it was, it was fantastic. Did you arrange that one? Mm -hmm. Okay. I, so I need to hear about your arrangement process, like start to finish. Like, what do you start with? And then, you know, how do you assign, for example, this is another Patreon question. Um, how do you assign parts to people with similar vocal ranges because like it's pretty obvious which parts are probably going to go to jeff he's going to mm -hmm. sing all the, the crazy low stuff but for people in the middle or you know how do you decide to give yourself a little solo here and there since you're primarily the beatboxer of the group i want to hear <laughs> all about it <laughs> okay this one worked a very differently than most other songs but that's okay um because i like to do different stuff and i i Sometimes I like to repeat myself, like if I've, I like to use pieces of something that I've done before, maybe in a new way. But for this one, I feel like was just like the most bizarre original 
idea that I've had in a while. And I, for a long time, I've been wanting to do a piece of classical music with no words. And this ended up being the one. And we knew we wanted to use Liz on this one. And she is a fantastic singer who used to sing in the Voices of Liberty at Disney. Mm. And that's how we met her when we were in high school. We were doing Candlelight and she was the soprano in the Voices of Liberty. So we always thought she was just such a goddess. And we were like, what, what can we put her in that would you know show off her incredible range? And I was like, this will be perfect. When starting on an arrangement, I need a section that I am highly inspired by to start. I mm. always start in the part of the arrangement. It doesn't have to be the beginning. In most cases, it's not. I need to start in the part of the arrangement that I know, I already know what I want for it. Um, ha having something that you really like to start with is really important for me because that's what gets all of the like juices and all of the creativity going at first. I like to do a lot of research at first and try to listen to as many other things that I can from that particular song, other arrangements. Um, this particular one was used in, um, it's used in a lot of movies. It's used in The Grinch. It's used in, uh, I mean, so cartoon. many commercials too. So many commercials. Uh, you hear it. You hear it everywhere all the time. There's there used to be like this Gerber commercial where like this baby was like causing <laughs> a ruck ruckus, and <laughs> it was like the baby's perspective, and it kept like changing. Da, 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 da. Anyway, everyone knows the song. That not everyone, everyone knows, knows this song, but nobody knows kind of what it's really exactly associated it, with. Exactly. So yeah, I. When starting the, it's the toughest part because I'm trying to come up with how it's going to look and how it's going to feel in that, in that first moment. Um, so I think that's like the, the general starting point. And then after that, it's like a giant puzzle that keeps changing and changing and changing until everything finally fits, or at least until I'm out of time. <laughs> <laughs> so when you start with the first section, do you, completely flesh that section out or will it all will you also likely come back and change things um everything can get changed um but if i start with something i like i probably won't change it after that um typically i'll work in pro tools and i'll have i don't know like i'll just set up like 10 tracks and i'll set up a piano and a bass set like a synth bass because that's what I feel like sounds most like our end product. And I don't always use the piano. It's just the piano is for me is for plucking out chords and maybe for plucking out ideas. But most of my ideas get recorded first, uh, recording into the mic, um, because I've, I can articulate exactly what I'm feeling, even if it's like, these are not the right notes, but this is a good rhythm type thing. Mm hmm. That's where I'll start. And I always, like I said, I like to start with the knowns. So I'm like, well, I know the melody has to be there. So I'll lay that down. And now I know, okay, now let's start with the next known. Well, I need to figure out the bass part. So let's get this part down, pluck it out. Okay. This is, this bass part is not leaving any room for anything else to happen. So I'll simplify it. Um, or maybe it's the opposite. Like the, this doesn't sound energetic enough. So the bass and the drums need to get amplified here. Um, and, and I'll take it section by section. Um, so for that song, I'll say that is a section and mm -hmm. I'll take like the song doesn't get created from start to finish linearly at all. It is just like a, this piece. Oh, and what about this piece? And now I'm on this section that's leading up to this piece. How am I going to connect these two pieces? What am I going to do that really leads this section into this section? Uh, and these are questions that I'm always asking myself. Does this, does this work? Does this lead? Does this feel like it's part of this next section? Is it too much like I'm just piecing these ideas together and it doesn't sound cohesive? Yeah. That's something that can happen a lot when you work in sections like that. So 
after you, after I work on all those sections, I work on tying them in together. And I think that's probably a good moment where these things tend to change and the section can change drastically. Another question I like to ask myself is, is this too much like the original? Is this not enough like the original? And I feel like that's a really, really tough balance um, while you're arranging something that is familiar to other people because you want to keep the thing that people love about the song. But you also don't want to be afraid to try something new and spin it in a way that people haven't heard it. So we do that well, a lot. I mean, that's something I think me certainly and others really respect about voice play and y'all's arrangements is that you do go for it creatively and often it works out really, really well. And you sit there wondering, this is this section is so different, but it really, really works. Some of my favorite moments is when you guys will put like some kind of trap beat. I think you did it in that you did in that song too. It's Definitely. just like it hits and you're like, this shouldn't work, but it really does. And something I talk about also a lot in my analysis videos about covers is you want to maintain the core of the original, you know, honor the original artist, honor the fans that like the original, but you also kind of have to make it your own if you're going to do a cover, especially I think in acapella music, because objectively doing something acapella is already going to be fundamentally different than the original. And you can do so many cool things with voices that you can't really do with instruments. And so it makes sense in the acapella world that, you might add a little more flair than if you were just doing like an acoustic cover of some song. So that's something I admire greatly about, about your group and certainly your arrangements. I appreciate that a lot. We, um, we work endlessly on these arrangements, Jeff, I, and Ellie, and, um, and they go through lots of different change. Like once I get it to a point, like the process is once I get it to a point where I think it's good, then I'll pass it off to the guys and then I'll get 10 notes back from everybody with timestamps. And it gets me thinking, yeah, a lot of people hate this part, but I love it because it gets me thinking about things I couldn't think about on my own. Um, and they're typically notes like, consider taking this further, consider repeating this section, consider raising this section up, consider lower, uh, cutting everything out except for just the vocals and you know get rid of the drums and the bass for the section a lot of notes like that um and is it a lot of is... a lot of Sorry. experimentation to kind of get to the final version so you'll have something that maybe you're like this sounds really good and then ellie's like yeah but you could try this and then you try <laughs> and you're like wait this is actually this works better absolutely and most of the time if if there are th thoughts like that. I've already tried so many ideas too, like for each section, I'll probably go through three iterations at least. Um, because if it's not quite doing it, I'm just like scratch. I'll mute the sections that I've already done. And my sessions are, are typically a mess in a, like a really good way because I like to be able to go back and listen to what I did and decide, was that better? Nope, it wasn't. Mm -hmm. um, or the opposite. So yeah. I, I really like to be able to go all the way back and then all the way forward to, to be able to make those decisions since, you know, if, if I'm changing section A, um, now I have like three options for section B, which one works best. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, just piggybacking off this, um, the Drunken Sailor you guys just did is by far the most interesting and fun cover of Drunken Sailor I've ever heard. I mean, that song by its nature can be so boring and mm -hmm. it's because it, i mean it is just strophic it is the exact same melody and structure and everything just with new text add infinitum and you guys completely turned it on its head and made it like if you had just if you had just heard it musically without the words you you might not even know it's drunken sailor it was like <laughs> it was like that different which i thought was fantastic and something that that song really needs especially when done by an acapella group, like we were saying a minute ago. That um, that arrangement is actually done by Jeff. And when I first heard it, believe me, or believe, believe you me, I <laughs> always have notes for everybody. And when I heard it, I was like, this is good. 
<laughs> I don't have any notes. And I think it was weird for Jeff because he was like, are you pranking me? <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. So now I'm interested because this is a whole process and it goes through these iterations. Like what is the, what is the time frame on voice play from when you're like, let's do this song. And then someone takes over the arrangement and it goes through all the iterations. Then you record it and you shoot video. What are the kind of, how long does each of those stages last? That's a, that's a good question. It definitely changes depending on what we're working on at the moment. But for the most part, I think it takes about a week to get a demo of a song arranged. Some, that can be fast sometimes. That can be slow sometimes. Some songs can just come together really quick. Um, I think my mother told me, well, I was like, I don't even know. I've never heard this song before. The chords are so cool. And I, I think I arranged it in just a few days. Mm. Um, and other songs, like the song that I'm working on right now for Halloween is taking, it's, I'm literally on week two right now and I'm still not done. So I think that has a little bit of range uh, depending on how complicated the song is. And then the next step is getting the guys to all record their parts. And so sending out the demo and everybody's part is labeled. Um, as you probably know, it's it's everyone doesn't have necessarily one part. There might be a lead track and a background track and then also like a secondary background track and then like a a grunt track. So like, it's not really that straightforward. Um, and then, so I think that takes about a week to get everyone's parts back because everyone has different availability to record their parts and, but everyone does record at home, which is really cool. Uh, it hasn't always been that way. Um, the next thing that happens is notes go out on based on things that need to get changed or fixed or, Hey, try this a little different get busier here um that will take a few more days typically um everyone's typically like right on the notes because that can just be frustrating waiting because you're like oh it's so close and now i just have one little thing i need to fill in um at that point in time the song is ready to get um videoed and during that whole like during the arrangement process during the recording process we work on the video and the clothing and this, like where it's going to be set, how we're going to do it. What is there acting involved? Is there no acting involved? Is it just like performance style? Um, and then after that, we like the video has to be edited and that takes about, I don't know, a few days to edit, but you also have to think about all the other things that you still have to do, whether it's with voice play or with whatever else you're working on, because all of us do other things. Um, so all in all, I would say it takes anywhere from a month to a month and a half, two months to get certain projects done. The way we have it right now is like a really good structure. And that Ellie, Jeff, and I all arrange a song. So like, and then we, <clears throat> Ellie will take January, I'll take February, Jeff will take March, which gives us two weeks to uh, to prepare that's uh, sorry, two months to prepare that particular song, which is so wonderful. <laughs> Some uh, in the past, it's been a month, but now it's two months, which really helps out. Awesome. So the release schedule for you guys is about one music video per month. Is that kind of the goal? Yeah, that's the goal. Sometimes okay. it happens. Sometimes we get extra. Sometimes we don't have enough. As you've seen, we also do minis and we're starting mm -hmm. some other projects. So everything um, f like has to bow just a little bit to make everything work. Sure. And one last question on the demo. So whoever whoever arranges makes the demo. And is the demo all vocals? Do you record all the parts and just like, you know, for Jeff, like Melodyne, the bass part way down so it's in his octave? Or just, just send him a synth bass part and say, figure it out. <laughs> make uh, it cool. <laughs> you know, that's funny. Is I have a tendency to want to sing it because I, I know where I want the inflections and I, where I want the power. Yeah. And it's also hard for me to like, imagine how the song is going to be with a synth bass on like a lead vocal. Um, but I, I think the other guys may like sometimes do something 
a little bit different than that, but I like to know how it's going to sound. So yes, I'll typically record his part up about four steps because an octave is too high and that sounds like too weird. Yeah. When everyone hears it, but four steps is like, okay, I get, it's like a really demonic lane. <laughs> and uh, I think that sounds most like Jeff <laughs> or at least what I'm going after. For sure. And how about for Ellie's really like high yeah. rock, high rock belts and stuff. It's so funny. Cause over the past couple of years, we've been, um, we don't, we don't tease him about it, but we say Ellie, like, this is a really cool part of your voice. Like you should use it way more often. Um, and I don't know if he was hesitant or just like, I don't, I don't want to overuse it. Like I don't, and, and I feel like we've been able to like get him to like really let loose, which is so cool. Cause I just, I've always been such a huge fan of his voice and you'll hear me on my demos mimic the way he sounds. <laughs> so yeah, it's really comical. Um, if some parts are too high and I'm trying to get intensity, I'll just shift them up the same exact way, like three or four steps. An octave can sound funny, like two chip monkey. So like, mm -hmm. it's hard to use your imagination on what that would actually sound like. Like, hey, I really want you to use your falsetto on this part, but you're in your full voice here. And I want you to vibrato here. And I want you to rock out here. And I want you to be sweet here. Like you have to be able to portray all those ideas in your vocal line because there's no like once they get the part they're going to record it and they don't have you right next to them telling every step of the way what to do so the guide is to the best of our ability and it's not always beautiful very cool um i want to wind the clock back um where did your training start and what is your your background in music i know voice play started kind of all the way back in high school for you guys basically right i mean has it did it just go from there immediately or did you did you go to undergrad and study music or or anything like that i um i i didn't do music in college i did computer engineering because i wanted to be a computer engineer and um i i really loved the technical side of music and the recording side of music. So I ended up using my degree to kind of figure all that stuff out. And to, while I went to college for computer engineering, I bought all this, like the cheapest recording equipment I could find to figure it out. Um, so that's, that's kind of how I figured out the recording part of it because every studio that we went to, I was just like, this isn't it. Like they're not, they're not doing the thing that you're supposed to be doing, whatever that is. And I got to figure it out. Um, but I did study classical music in Suzuki with violin ever since I was four. And that's really been my main knowledge of like music as a whole, I would say. And, and I played in a symphony in high school to, to kind of figure out. I think that's really helpful for a musician to to be able to play with a symphony or like play an instrument of any sort. If you're a singer to play an instrument, I think that's really extremely helpful to be able to know. And also to be able to kind of know for songwriting where each instrument lives and what their range is and why they're playing it in those ranges. Um, just really useful knowledge. I think for anyone who's trying to work on writing, arranging, composing of any style yeah absolutely very and you've actually played violin in certain videos haven't yes you? that's why you've seen me play in in very specific songs but from here like my violin playing gets sprinkled in because i'm not like super confident of it because i haven't actually stuck with it and played it every day like i used to but it's funny because when i pick it up i'm like yeah, i remember this um, but all of the parts that you hear, like, oh my gosh, they are hours of me practicing. And it's not even that much. I think I've only played in like two or three songs. I mean, it's the, that is the kind of thing you really want to nail. If you yeah. figure it out, you don't want to be sloppy on the violin when everything else is so tight, you know? <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. And we hardly, I mean, when's the last time you heard an instrument in a voice play arrangement? Like, yeah, Never. I was trying to think the last time I heard you pull the violin out. It's been a while. Yes, 
That's true. <laughs> <laughs> um, when did beatboxing come into the mix? I believe you were singing baritone and still do some, but you were more previously at some at some point. So when did the beatboxing come in and how did you get so proficient at it? Appreciate that. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I was the baritone in the group when we, okay, let's start back in high school. It was me and Jeff and Earl back in high school. We were like the top, or we were we were like the three people in the group. And then we had Michael Kilgore, which is now, he's now on Off-Broadway, On-Broadway, all over the place. And Scott Porter, which is now, he's in um, that Hollywood. show, Georgia. Yeah, he's he is in everything. He, um yeah, I remember I, wa um, I watched the whole show, Friday Night Lights. Yep. And then y'all came out with Halo and I was like, holy shit, that's the guy. Yeah. From Friday Night Lights. <laughs> what is he doing in this voice play video? And then I found out he was part of the group, which was very yes. unexpected. It's so funny. <laughs> when we um yeah, and when he left the group to I I I'm guessing he he went off to to go be in Hollywood. I don't I don't actually remember. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He went he had an acting career ahead of him for sure. So he was like, I'm going to go do this. And we were like, yeah, you should. Because <laughs> there's no money in this. <laughs> I think there's probably a lot of money in Friday Night Lights. <laughs> right. Yes. And that, oh man, that was so awesome for us to be able to see him just like make that leap. And um, anyway, that left a hole in the group. He was a beatboxer and he was super good. Um, and he brought a lot of flair to the table, a lot. Um so that was my chance to be like, we were like, who are we going to get to beatbox? And we're, I was like, guys. And because um, I was like, it would be way easier to find a baritone. Like any anybody can be a baritone. So that's what we started to search for. And that's when I became the beatboxer. And I, I think we had like a show, which when, when I say show, I mean like we performed at bookstores a bagel store. Um, we performed at a fair. And I think this fair might have been my like debut. <laughs> and I was like, I'm I got this. I'm solid. And I got up there and I just, you know, hyperventilated for three sets. And <laughs> and it was good. It was fine. Um, but ever since then I was like, okay, I gotta really figure this out and learn how to breathe and how to make all these sounds that I want to learn how to make. It and I wasn't really... starting from scratch at that point. Like we were all like gee, Jeff and Earl and I were all playing around with making sounds with our mouths. So it wasn't it, starting from zero. It really does take a lot of stamina to beatbox for a show. I mean, I remember yes. doing it back in college just for, I was one of the beatboxers in the college group and, you know, so beatbox a few of the songs and just a couple songs in a row. It can gas you if you're not, <laughs> if you're not really yeah. used to it um especially if you're not working on a system that's like helping you if you're like working against it you're just like definitely try to do it as loud as you possibly can and that'll just tire you out yes for sure so how have your skills developed since then i assume you've picked up a ton of new tools in your toolkit sounds and such i think yeah over the years uh like we performed with other groups and i was able to pick up like some of their sounds, which was really helpful for me to like watch other people do it in person. You're just like, how did you make that sound? Um, that's the best way possible. You can, you can look all day on YouTube and not like, eat, I don't know, having that 360 degree view is like really helpful and having somebody explain it to you in person is invaluable. So I think that's how I kind of picked up sounds along the way. I also had a few sounds that I just like some miraculously figured out by trying and trying and trying until it just happened. And, and I also feel like I maybe got a, a little better with figuring out the arrangements of the drums and like how those get pieced together after recording them. And you start paying more attention to what you're actually doing and, and the t not only like your tempo and the timing, but like how, how busy you're being and how not busy you're being and um, how loud certain sounds are and how soft dynamics and 
you start to really incorporate all those things that normal drummers would actually incorporate and and that like every little bit helps along the way so do you think of your beatboxing more like a vocal percussionist rather than a beatboxer i feel like there's you can kind of think of them differently beatboxing at least beatboxing to me has always felt more like the sound effects and the flashy kind of crazy stuff whereas vocal percussion feels like you're actually just working much more towards that kind of core drum kit sound i think so yeah the beat the the beatboxing can be like a like really a solo act to me and the vocal percussion is like yeah i i am the drummer for this group but i i don't know i like i like all kinds of sounds i don't like just like a drum kit i like um electronic sounds too and then really organic human sounds too so i like to combine as many as i can and as many as i can learn with my particular face <laughs> <laughs> that is true you kind of need a certain setup and everyone's got a different setup Definitely. to make different sounds or even the quality of the the same sound that someone else is making might be different same as a singer i mean we're all we all have a very unique setup that way for sure um i was just thinking about the trap beats that you guys put in where do you remember the first one that y'all did and where did the inspiration come from from that i personally have a huge history and background in electronic music so whenever that happens i just freak out it's like my favorite thing to just have a trap beat come out of nowhere but where where did you guys get that inspiration uh, i just like it i just i'm a <laughs> fan of it um i th i think the very first thing that we did that might have had it in it was trouble um, which was one of our first music videos that we ever posted on YouTube. Um, and then later it found its way into several other, like it just keeps finding its way and I can't stop it. I can't help myself. <laughs> Even though like that, maybe that particular genre isn't quite as popular anymore. I still love it for us. And like, it's so fun and it's so, it can turn something like kind of bright into dark, which is really fun for me um and it's also a way to 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 do some to to take a section that you're not expecting it to go to that place that definitely is something that makes people go huh, i never expected that but i like it and it grooves differently yeah definitely switches the groove i would say it is still popular but it's it's it is more of the niche popularity almost like acapella like you can go uh -huh. see sold out trap electronic shows all over the country all over the world but you're not hearing it on the radio on like pop radio exactly you know but it's awesome and i think people who at least like because a lot of people were once into it that maybe don't listen to it as much anymore so it's almost like a nostalgia kick too if you Definitely. got used, used to be in the electronic scene and you're listening to this acapella group that you found they just drop a <laughs> killer trap beat with only voices you're like whoa wait a second i, I think it's that. also something that you're just like you kind of are hoping the acapella group does it because you're just like, I don't know. <laughs> like, even if you're watching Pitch Perfect, when they go there, you're like, yeah, they did. <laughs> it is it is awesome every time as far as as far as I, when it's done well, it's good every time, in my opinion. Yeah, agreed. <laughs> OK, so you are balancing voice play with being a family man with Patty Cake Productions. What does... And I know this is going to shift week to week as it does for any person who doesn't have a nine to five, but like, what does kind of a week look like for you? Average template for a week. Um, okay. Yeah. That's a good question. Um, so like a week, a week would look like, um, I go into patty cake a lot physically. So like you'll see me there. Oh gosh setting up for a music video or working on some music with Tony. Um, and then um, basically after we have finished what we need to finish there, I come home and work on voice play stuff. Um, and voice play like this week, I've been working on this arrangement every single day for like, I don't know, like three or four hours. Um, so my day gets split up a lot. Um, some days I'll have to work eight hours of patty cake and then come home and work four hours late at night. Um, other times like I'm, 
there are other moments where I'm like, okay, I can breathe. I only have to work on one thing at a time. And I can, um, the balance is hard. <laughs> uh, it's a lot of things to keep going, a lot of plates to keep in the air. Um, and, and then, you know, the family too, like I love spending time with my family. So it's just like, I would, I would almost rather give all my time to my family, but I can't cause I gotta like keep these other things going. Um, that's the that's the really tough part, but um, that sh that shifts and changes. Um, like there are moments where I really want to focus on career and trying to get something accomplished that I've never accomplished before, and there are other moments where I'm just like, screw all this. I just want time with my family. Like I want to hang out with my wife. I want to go to Disney with with Doris. I want to hang out with my kids and eat dinner. Like it's yeah. It's a lot. That's, I also had a question about work-life balance. So that that kind of sums that up as well. Um, I definitely find myself struggling a lot because I, I want to do everything, but not everything can be done. So it's really about choosing what what you think is most important and being on the same page with your business partner or business partners to make sure that... Um, so like voice play, we have a meeting every Monday morning, right, right at 9 a.m. And we talk about what we have accomplished that previous week and what we're about to accomplish this coming week. And Kathy is kind of like in charge of all of that. And she is like, she, she keeps track of everything and makes sure everybody's like on point and doing everything that they should be doing. And then, you know, sometimes we'll talk about what arrangement we're going to work on. Why are we going to work on that arrangement? Do people want that? Do they like this song? Um, we talk about that a lot. Just so crazy to me because you never know when a song is going to hit or not going to hit or people are going to like it or not. It's really tough to figure that out. And we have tried. Oh my gosh, have we tried <laughs> to figure it out. And every time we think we have it figured out, we don't. So the, the the thing that we've kind of come to a consensus about is like, if you feel passionately about it and you think people, like if it's in both categories in both circles, this Venn diagram, it's like there's a circle of peop songs that you think people want to hear. And then there's a circle of songs that you want to work on. The overlap with those two circles is like where we should be working. Yeah. Um, it's a difficult thing like, as, a, as an oh, artist man. or creator. Definitely. And I'm sure, you know, it's, you, you never really know. <laughs> you never really know. You never really you know can for do sure. is make your best, best guess at it. The other difficult thing. And a drunken sailor is a great example is drunken. The all's arrangement of drunken sailor is so amazing and it's so good. And the fact that it's so good and so different from the original is like a big risk, right? Because you're likely going to have, some people who love it, who are like, I'm obsessed with this. This is the best drunken sailor arrangement I've ever heard. That's the camp I'm in. That's pretty much the camp I'm always in when you guys put out a song. But there's also like the masses that will be turned off just because it's different from over and over and over again. So you'll you can have some completely bland, totally non-creative version of that song blow up. And you can have a super hyper creative, amazing song not perform as well. That's the other tough thing about yeah, it. Yeah. And it, it's so true. Like we released Wellerman about, I don't know, like a month ago. And it blew up. And when we talked about it, and when we talked, or at least when I talked about the arrangement, I had Rob, um, one of our other arrangers is Rob, and he does a lot of our minis. And I was, when I was telling him about it, and I was like, we're going to do all six verses and we're going to keep it really, really, really simple. Like not the typical voice play arrangement where we go berserk. It's just going to be like the song. And th <laughs> I think that was actually really tough for me to say, because I was just like, if people want the song, they can go get the song somewhere else. Like it already exists 18 other places, but it was just kind of this test of this song that people love and are obsessed with for some reason. I don't get it. I mean, I like it, but I'm not scouring the internet to find other versions of it. So you, 
I, I, I'm pretty sure you guys did a version of it too, the Bass King. We haven't done Wellerman yet, but the Wellerman did Wellerman. <laughs> that's kind of the that was that. Then Bobby's Bobby is in both groups. Got it. Got so that's it. probably what you're thinking of. And yeah, that that their version has 14 million views. It's insane. And it and is. It, I mean, it is. It is the simplest. There's like some harmony, but I mean, yeah. it is very much just straight up verse to verse to verse to verse. Absolutely, yep. absolutely viral. And that really just goes to show, like, it doesn't have to be anything crazy. It can just be good. Yeah. And people will like it. And I suppose that depends on the genre as well. Like something like a sea shanty that originally was done. So like the most raw. Exactly. Like just a bunch unison. of people that probably couldn't sing at all. Just singing or singing along, you know? So something like that, I'd say the risk probably goes up trying to do something super creative with it. Um, Tommy P who's in the bass gang did. Uh, did a version of the Wellerman that was pretty creative, pretty different. And it got a decent amount of attention, but it was also like pretty split. People were like pretty fired up about like, this is awesome. Or like, this sucks. Why'd you change it? <laughs> it's like another part of, you know, being an artist and making a choice. We, um, we've gotten that a few times. Uh, the biggest one I can think of is Phantom for us when we did the phantom arrangement and people were so polarized by that arrangement. I'll never forget. Some people love it. And other people were just like, I cannot believe you guys defaced and defiled this song the way you did. Like never do anything ever again. Qu don't quit your day job. It was just like, isn't it amazing how people get in the comment section? It's shocking oh to gosh. me every day. I'm surprised. And at this point it just bounces off, but I'm still surprised by it. People will say the darndest things, not just kids. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. true. And you can offend them really easily just by oh, making the arrangement different. Yes. It's shocking what, what can offend people. Um, I want to get back to just before we dive into Patreon questions for the last 10 minutes. Um, sure. You'd mentioned accomplishments and I'm interested what career goals you have and perhaps uh, maybe for voice play as well. If you guys are, kind of one brain in that way. That's actually a really good question. Um, we would always like to figure out how to keep our living going at this point, because I don't, oh, it took us the longest time to kind of figure this out and make this where it could sustain us. It took a long time. Like we, we were like, our first show was in 1999, if that means anything to you. Same year SpongeBob so, came out. That's right. We were babies. <laughs> and, you know, we were, what, 18? And now, so many years later, we finally figured it out. And we're all like, we're all dads now. And we're all just like, this would have been great 15 years ago. <laughs> we, had, uh, we had a really interesting, like, way here like we we did some bizarre things we've we did a we did a tour in kentucky where we did it for free and we never got paid we did we performed for oh, no and opened up for 98 degrees um at the sea world for a show. A, was it nick lachey yeah okay <laughs> and then we ended up doing the sing-off yeah where he was one of the judges so like and then everything in between was just like if you think back, it's just like bizarre how we got here. Uh, and there's so, so many stories. Um, that's the best part. Um, yeah. But yeah, yeah, I think I think keeping it going is like a really big goal of ours right now. Um, finding the right work balance is, I think, another thing that we're all trying to find, all of us, um, we struggle with trying to make all of our fans happy and Patreon and making sure there are enough releases and making sure we try enough new things and don't get stale. And, and, um, it, it's, it's a lot of work. It's um, a job. So yeah, it's a full-time job and mm -hmm. trying to, trying to keep that balance is really tricky. So I think that's another one of our goals. Um, this is something that we talk. Can I answer this question about our, our, show that we have coming up please yeah okay so we don't perform a lot anymore just because 
COVID hit and it changed everything for the entire music industry. And some things just are not back to the way they were. And this is one of them. But we got invited to perform live with the, the band Chicago, which is so freaking cool for us because I know a lot of people right now may not remember who they are, but when we were growing up, I thought they were pretty cool. And uh, we're going to be performing with them coming up and it's going to be live and it's also going to be put on Apple Music. So that's going to be super cool. Awesome. When is that? That is in November. I don't know when it comes out on Apple Music. I'm pretty sure it's going to be a video of the whole thing also in addition to the audio. Awesome. Okay. This this chat will probably come out, I think, early November. Okay. So that could be so perfect for timing. But ultimately, like getting people to know who we are and what we do is like our main objective. Like voice play being a, a name that you say and 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 you know what it is and and what that style of music is 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 a goal for sure. Do you have any intention of branching beyond the acapella world? Just because acapella is so niche, there's a much more limited audience for acapella music, at least currently. It's been talked about a lot, um, but there, there's not endless time, yeah. And so I don't, I don't know if if that'll ever get tried. We've talked about so many different ideas. The Monday One of meetings. our ideas is is put it in the Monday meetings. We've <sighs> talked about putting a younger, more handsome group together <laughs> and arranging for them. I think that's still a pretty good idea. But, <laughs> Our fans would be like, what? who's this? Who is this? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Let's move on to uh, some Patreon questions. Sure. Got about seven or eight minutes. All right. Let's make okay. this quick. So, yeah, we'll, we'll kind of try to <laughs> try to burn through them. Um, you talked about this a little bit. Um, Patricia Schumann asks, could you talk a bit about your transition from your original role as baritone to taking over the beatboxing slot with voice play? We kind of we kind of covered that one already, didn't we? Mm -hmm. um, let me see if she, this question goes on. I only underlined part of it because I wanted to make sure we got through them all, but let me see if there's something else. I can answer a hair more of that question. If you okay, want. please, please, yeah. Uh, the transition, I feel like I already explained, but something that was very helpful for me was singing those background parts and knowing like doing it firsthand was really helpful. I've also been in other groups, like we pref other groups in Orlando, like when I was probably in my twenties, I performed at universal with other acapella groups and I was able to do bass and like this other part that's like bass and VP, which you guys it's bizarre. You don't want to hear, but you do them both at the same time. I think that helped me understand what resonates with people and also what the singer likes to do. Um, and like from that perspective, what would be a good break? What would be fun? What would keep me entertained for that full song from the singer's point of view? And I think that's really thoughtful um, when you're arranging for other people. So I think that that helped being in those other roles. Yeah, being a good collaborator. Super, super important. Very cool. Uh, okay. <clears throat> LKH is the name. When you're at home puttering around the house, do you practice, try out new beatboxing sounds for the next song? And follow-up question, if yes, how do your wife and daughters react? <laughs> <laughs> the answer is yes. And <clears throat> my wife ignores it at this point in time. <laughs> but my youngest daughter imitates me, which is so freaking funny. Um, I love it so much. I'm like, how how do you know how to make these beats? Like, but she'll like turn my like drum beats into like fart sounds, but she'll keep the same time of it all. She's really creative. <laughs> Very funny. And she's awesome. seven years old, so you know, she's trying to get my goat. Yeah, she gets it. She knows how oh, yeah. to Knows how to poke at you. Exactly. Brilliant. Um, Eileen Wood was asking a question about arranging for all these talented singers. Um, some of it we already covered, but the last part is how do you arrange for these singers and avoid any kind of Lane likes you best type conflicts? I guess, meaning how do you make sure to spread the love out evenly? I guess this question would go for Ellie and Jeff as well when they're arranging. 
Um, you know what's funny is I don't I don't, I've never heard that before. Like Lane likes you best, or Lane doesn't like you. I've only heard like I'm gonna kill Lane because he gave me a part that's too high or too fast <laughs> or too low. You know what I mean? <laughs> um, it's 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 fine. They they always take care of it. They're really good at what they do, and they might complain about things like that, but I don't necessarily take them to heart. Because I don't know if I don't think they really mean them. I think they're just teasing me. It doesn't and seem it doesn't seem like a big group of divas. It, they're not. No, yeah. I mean they might. A few of them might act that way or have moments <laughs> in that way. But I, I know what they're capable of. Um, I wouldn't say more than them, but I do know. I've sung with them long enough to know like who's gonna do what. Yeah. And sometimes that changes. Like there was a song friends on the other side and I had it slated for Jeff to sing the entire song. And Jeff was like, I, it doesn't make any sense for me to sing this. Jay is going to sound incredible on it. He's like, just give me some of the parts, but give Jay the, the lead. And I was like, that makes sense. Okay. Awesome. So there are definitely moments like that where we'll have a conversation about something I've done and then we'll just change it. <clears throat> yeah. Wonderful. Okay, this is a quick one. Um, how old were you when you learned how to beatbox and sound like a percussion set of drums? I guess how how old were you when you really started playing around with it? Seriously, probably fifteen or sixteen in high school. In high school, definitely. Awesome, that makes sense. Um, we've kind of already talked about this as well. This is from Isaac, and he asks, "How do you juggle the demands at Patty Cake and voice play?" Yeah. One day at a time. <laughs> you did as answer much... that earlier. It's like patty cake in the morning, voice play in the evening. Yeah. Pretty much. Yeah. Sometimes it switches, but yeah, for the most part, it's just like teetering back and forth between the two. Yeah. 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 Shifting priorities depending on mm -hmm. what needs most work. Mm -hmm. a lot, and a lot of times I'm like, okay, well, I have. I have today to get this done and it has to be done or else tomorrow gets screwed up. So like giving your t yourself parameters to work in and a and a realistic time frame is really important. Like it shouldn't be impossible, but you shouldn't also drag something on that you that you are fully capable of doing. Yeah. That does make it easier to prioritize when it's a, a necessity. Mm -hmm. for the next day you're like okay well i don't have a choice i'm just going to work on this one project <laughs> today exactly. um okay last question this is from carmen today what beatboxing effect was the hardest to figure out mm. a lot of them are hard to figure out there's like a there's like an inward sound that is very difficult um I forgot what it's called, but it's where you can roll your tongue with the suction going in. And that can create lots of different sounds, but it's a starting point for a lot of sounds. And that one was really hard for me to get. And I'll never forget trying in the car every day for hours uh, on my, wherever I was driving. And it just didn't happen. Nothing happened. And I kept trying and trying and trying. And this was probably months later. And I was like, this is never going to happen. <laughs> I was like, I've tried this over a hundred times and it hasn't worked. And one day it just happened. It was bizarre. And I was like, holy cow. Um, I think they call it like inward drag. And it's. Oh, the, you... the mic kind of cut out first. It kind of. It's unfor I don't know. It's cutting out right when you start. Maybe it's too much power. But it's it's a lot like rolling your R's out. Okay. Like, but it's inward. So you should you should try it. <laughs> if you're if you're sitting at home, you should try it like ad nauseum <laughs> until one day it finally works. <laughs> awesome. All right. <laughs> that is going to wrap it up. So actually, any final words you have for the listeners and the supporters and the fans? Hey, um, thank you. I didn't get a chance to thank you. I love watching your stuff and i think you have a lot to offer on youtube and i appreciate what you do thank you um, so much i appreciate that we don't we we don't watch 
I don't lo- watch a lot of <clears throat> reactors because I get frustrated personally because I feel like it's just somebody watching us and being like smiling and laughing yep. and crying and clapping. And it's like, I don't, yeah. I want the like, I want to, I want the feedback of somebody that knows what they're doing. Someone like you who might actually know more than me in some cases <laughs> about what I'm actually doing or arranging or what's going on in that arrangement. It's cool. Cause I'm like, I'm a lot of my ideas are subconscious and I don't always think those things that you verbalize. And it's nice to be like, he's right. I was thinking that. <laughs> Well, Which I am is so backwards. So appreciate honored, it. honored to be a soundboard for you guys anytime. <laughs> awesome. Cool. Well, thank you so much for, for joining me this morning. I'm sorry we have to cut off a little shorter than we might have. And we will we'll figure out a way in the future to get that Pro Tools session up. That's going to be really cool. I think you're going to like that. And I like showing that off. So let's figure it out. Yeah, we will figure it out. So I got to run. Thank you so much, so much, so much. I will keep you posted on release schedules and all that and potential collaboration posts and things as the time gets closer awesome thank you so much for having me see you lane